he now his tongue moves as he calls those Christians who are suffering and under arrest from these rich landowners, quite possibly, but we know that the Christians in these dispersed believers were facing persecution and hardship and difficulties. And he wants them to be patient above all things. We can know in a Greek letter would have several parts to it in, in, in conclusion. And James' letter is no different here in these final sections. In verses 7 through 11, we have a summary, really, of a call to patient endurance. And then, in a way, a certification of the letter in verse 12 of, of an oath, certifying the truth, a call to speak the truth. And then we have, in a way, a health wish in verses uh, 13 onwards, with far greater than the health wish is that, that of Christian prayer. God's provision of Christian prayer. And then in verses 19 to 10, 20, we have a statement of intent of why he is writing it that it will bring to the restoration of the sinner. Of course, these Christians are being oppressed. And what are they to do? How are they to respond? Are they to take up arms? Are they to act in some revolutionary manner? No. James tells them in James chapter 1, verse 20, For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Rather, they are exhorted to patiently endure the various kinds of trials until Christ returns. We are living in unprecedented times, aren't we? How often have we said that word and heard that word since March came into being with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic? And at first we thought, well, it's a nice, maybe even a bit of light relief, a bit of change. But now here we are in 2021, it continues, it prevails. What is our thought upon it? It's true, controlling much of our lives and dictating what we can do and cannot do as human beings and as Christians. And we see through it as well that there is a control from uh, those in the world who are the wealthy landowners, who are the global elite, as it were, and control the masses. So it's no surprise at this time of uncertainty that we see social media awash with all types of conspiracy theories. You may be even taken up with them. And a conspiracy theory is this, it takes a kernel of truth and distorts that kernel of truth. That's with misinformation, now the relatively true or lie of a conspiracy theory. One of such at this moment in time is the Great Reset. And the Great Reset is a proposal which was brought about by the World Economic Forum in May to rebuild the economy sustainably following the COVID-19 pandemic. And it was propagated by Prince Charles and uh, the director of the World Economic Forum Klaus Schwab. But the conspiracy theory of the Great Reset imagines that a global elite is using COVID-19 as an opportunity to empower the global elites of the world, to enable them to control the masses, to roll out radical policies in regard to the environment, social restructuring, our liberties, to control the masses with such things as forced vaccinations, digital ID cards, and the renunciation of private property. 
And we have recently seen counter demonstrations in London with people demonstrating, led by Jeremy Corbyn's brother, who's been fired and arrested. And they have had placards showing the Great Reset. And then we have the firework display, didn't we, in London, with all its bits and bobs identifying things that's going on in the world. Now, I'm not here to denounce or support the Great Reset or the conspiracy fears around it. But at this time, whatever is going on, the truth does remain. There are those who are wicked who will seek to manipulate and control the masses in civilization. That's what was going on here. These rich landowners who he was talking to, who were seeking to live their own lives and control others. But it will all come to an end. Not by some counter-revolution that we propagate, but by the coming of the Lord. The question is, how are we to respond to all these trials and tribulations and the works of the wicked? It's quite clear the wicked, verse 5 in James, they will be slaughtered. They will be slaughtered by the coming judgment of the Lord. What is our response in 2021? Well, it's to be patient, to endure, have the capacity to accept and tolerate delay, problems. Suffering, turmoil, wars. Be patient in the midst of suffering. That's what he's saying in verse 7, isn't it? Be patient, therefore. Therefore, because of what is going on, those rich land, warning to the rich, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord, <laughs> be patient. This is the Christian response to a troubled world. Not to be extreme right wing, not to be extreme left wing. It's to be Christian. Be biblical. Have the biblical worldview of what is going on in the world. And, and what sort of response is it called for? A revolution, as it were, of the heart. From the trials, he's returning to it, isn't he? From chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, where we were to count it all joy. To exercise faith, not to be double-minded, but to seek the wisdom of God, not the wisdom of man. Because the day of the wicked's judgment will come, as the day of our deliverance will come. Revelation 21 verse 8 says, The cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. I wonder if we would come a day when from preaching something like this, even from a pulpit, one would be arrested. Maybe. We must be patient. He must endure. But for these believers, they faced various kinds of trials. They were persecuted. They were stoned to death. They were thrown into gladiator arenas. They were oppressed. They were trodden on. Why should we expect anything different? Or granted anything different? That same Lord who is coming to slaughter is also coming to deliver. Revelation 22, 20. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. Patience isn't some abstract virtue. It's not simply something which is the right thing to do. 
Christian patience is rooted in the person and the coming of the Lord, isn't it? Be patient there, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. That's why we are patient, because we know the Lord is coming. We see the prize ahead of us. Jesus, our Lord, our blessed Saviour and Redeemer, our conquering King. And so we patiently endure the reproach because of all that lies ahead. This was something that Moses was commended for. Hebrews 11, 26 tells us, he considered the approach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. This is what produces Christian patience and faithfulness. He's looking to the Lord in a corrupt world. Because if we put our minds and focus upon the things and the trials and tribulations and all that is going on, and create counter-narratives or narratives ourselves, rather than sticking to the scriptures and the word of God, we're going to be tossed to and fro all over the place. We're going to start seeing the things that James talks about here in verses 7 to 12, which we shall see. In the word, it's full of Christ. Not only of his life and his death and resurrection, but of his coming. For his church. For two millennia now. This church has been here for 200 years as a building of his people meeting in this place. But for two millennia the church has been waiting. Patiently. Enduring. Suffering. Trials of various kinds. For the Lord. To return. And this isn't just some doctrinal truth. This isn't just some doctrinal truth. It's in building to our very Christian DNA, isn't it? This is what we're expectant of. This is what we are awaiting. This is our experience. As we experience the new birth and the resurrection unto life, we experience the reality and the truth that the Lord Jesus is returning. And we are awaiting that. And so, Christian patience in the midst of suffering is rooted in that tangible expectancy of the Lord's return. It's there in the promises of his word. And then so James brings out an illustration, doesn't he? Suffering, what that purpose is, it produces a harvest. And he, he, it's the example of the farmer. See how the farmer waits. The farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. Being patient about it until it receives the early and the right rains. You also be patient. In the Palestinian climate, they were awaiting those early rains in October when they sow the seed, the ground to be fertile, and the later rains in March and April before the harvest, which would add the extra strength and nutrients to the seed, to the wheat, and bring a harvest. Father had to wait patiently. And we patiently endure, as it were, these latter rains and these rains of suffering and trials and difficulties because, as we say, they produce steadfastness, they produce Christ likeness. We fix our eyes upon the Lord because it brings Christian maturity and holiness into our lives. It's a real testing of our faith. So he embraces the trials of joy and steadfastness, but also in patient endurance, because it will bear precious fruit of Christian maturity. That's why in uh, 
James 1.12, he says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. He will be glorified, perfected. Alec Matea writes, James's doctrine of the Christian life is a doctrine of process or growth, and patience is a central requirement. Patience. I don't know what addresses will go, be coming uh, from pulpits uh, today or thoughts, but we need to be patient. We neither drift into holiness, nor are we wafted there by some heavenly visitation, he says. We grow into holiness of life. And like every harvest, it is a process. And although we may not understand this process, James wants us to be assured that God has ordained it, God germinates the seed, God promotes the growth, God swells the grain until the harvest is ready. And then the precious fruit is harvested. And it's the same in our lives. We see that same miracle in our lives. The Father will have us ready. Nothing will stop this process from taking place. But we are called to patiently endure and await the Lord's return when he gathers in that harvest. So be patient in suffering. But also be patient because we think we just sit back and we don't do anything. No, but we do. We have to watch and we have to wait and we have to act. He says, be patient. Verse 8 9. You also be patient. Establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. So here is this. This patience requires establishing, and it is, is the same meaning as being establishing, fixing, strengthening your hearts, your own hearts, in the midst of these various kinds of trials, but also then considering your brother or your sister. Do not grumble against one another. We see the call to action. Is so important when we are in the midst of trials to establish our own hearts and our fellowship with one another. So I'm sure we're all aware of the disturbances in one's own heart and fellowship with one another. When we are, have a disturbed heart ourselves, we can find ourselves if our hearts are not established upon the Lord. We can find ourselves grumbling, especially when difficulties take place and things happen. When various kinds of trials befall the church or befall us individually, we can, we can question why. We can start arguing among one another, brethren, because of what has come upon us. We can turn in on ourselves and on one another. That's the sinful flesh. Often we find, don't we? Rather than having established hearts in the Lord, we can have hearts which are divided. To establish your hearts, the Greek word is derisio, and it means to make stable, to strengthen, to fix in one's own mind. It's really a reinforcement of this call to patience, endurance, by focusing upon the central need of a fixed heart. When trials come, you're not tossed to and fro by them. You're established, you're grounded, you have a firm foundation upon the Lord. Something we see in the Lord Jesus throughout his life. It tells us that when he was rejected in the Samaritan
villages in Luke 9, 51, that when the day drew near, it says, for him to be taken up, he set his face. Sterizio, he set his face. He established himself to go to Jerusalem. He established, he had that resolute mind and heart to go to Jerusalem, to do the Lord's will. He was determined, resolute, persistent. He would suffer and be rejected and hated and despised, and yet he would give his life a ransom for many. He lived out a harvest of righteousness. He was patient. He endured. Because his heart was established. It was fixed. doing it that of his father's will. We must establish our hearts, brothers and sisters, in the midst of trials. The Lord is at hand. And we fix our eyes upon Jesus, don't we? As he fixed his eyes upon us to redeem the people. upon him. It's a bit of a, a juxtaposition with uh, what is said earlier in chapter 5 verse 5. Notice what the rich and wealthy landowners fix their hearts on. You have lived on earth in luxury, in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. Establish your hearts in the Lord and in due season he shall lift you up Because where your heart is, that's where your treasure is. Treasure the Lord. Love the Lord with all your heart and soul and strength. Trust in Him. Lean not on your own understanding, but acknowledge Him. Be patient as you suffer. You will suffer. I'm not here to give you a feel-good message today. I suppose you know that. then we can say, be patient with one another as well in the midst of those trials. Because don't rumble with one another, James says. So obviously that must have been a problem. Do not rumble with one another. So you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Don't become impatient. Have your heart established upon the Lord. Fix your eyes upon him as you suffer. Await that appearing of the Lord. Than it's what's inside when you get knocked often flows out. Think about like a, a, a Bay Maria somewhere, it's filled up with a, a catering Bay Maria and all the soups filled up with soup, pretty much to the brim. And you're knocking, it just spills. Oh, Danielle, the other day, we were having a cup of tea in bed as we usually do, and she nearly knocked my teeth out, and uh, the tea went all over the bed, scorching hot. And, you know, it's like that, you know, what, what's inside comes out. We, we, we need to establish our hearts in the Lord. We need to be patient. We need to bear forth those fruits of the Holy Spirit of God. Our hearts let us turn. This is the problem of the tongue that he's turning to again, isn't it? Don't you see that? Do not grumble with one another. He's been talking about the tongue throughout. And our tongues let us all down. We, we've all witnessed that. We see in the different responses with COVID-19 as a, as a fellowship, how we deal with the dilemma of it. We all have differing opinions and responses. It calls us to grumble towards one another. You could even 
find ourselves grumbling at others because of specific trials that have befallen us. Uh, and they could be laid out of, of a brother or a sister. Well, it's because she did this or he said that. This is my predicament. I'm finding so. So I'm grumbling about a brother or a sister. Or in our trials, we, we grumble at others because maybe they failed to pray for us. Or the pastor doesn't really care for us. We believe how this should be done, how that should be done. And so we start to grumble with one another in the midst of trials that we're going through. Rather than establishing our hearts, looking onto the Lord Jesus and being patient and enduring. And speaking that which is true and wholesome and good and right. The truth of the matter is we're exhorted not to grumble. James 3.18, he writes, A harvest of righteousness is only sown in peace by those who make peace. This is the legacy of those who have established hearts. They make peace. I was just thinking about this, and uh, the Lord Jesus, when he was with his disciples, uh, you know, they had troubled hearts and troubled minds. They argued with one another, who's the greatest, who's this, that, and the other. And then Jesus comes into their presence, and he brings his peace upon them. He brings his peace upon them. He says, the peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, I give it to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Well, that time he's in at the resurrection and uh, uh, they're locked up in fear of the Jews and he comes in and he not only just imparts a blessing and bringing his peace be upon them, he literally brings his peace. We're people of peace. God's peace. And peace brings forth a harvest of righteousness among God's people. And so when we speak or grumble with one another, we, we rob ourselves of peace and a rich harvest. And the earlier instruction as well in chapter 4, verse 11 of James, do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge. He who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbour? I believe ultimately, if we continue to grumble, we, we will receive that which we have given. As James says in James 2.13, for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. We are to be merciful. We are to be people of peace and of peace with one another. The bonds of peace. If they are here the warning, don't they? Look there. Do not grumble against one another, brother, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Speaking of the addresses that James brought to us in Revelation of the seven churches, the Lord Jesus stands at that door of Lady Spirit, isn't he? He's standing on the threshold of the door. He stands on the threshold of every church of his. And he will judge us. He will judge us for every idle word that is spoken. Those whom I love, he says, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. He stands at, that, at the church's door. Be patient in the midst of trials. Following the example of others too, verse 10, as an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job. The prophets, they were the ones who endured, didn't they? 
great hardship. Yet they spoke the word of the Lord. They suffered. They were persecuted. They were trodden on. And James picks them up and he says, remember their example. They were the ones that were speaking out God's word. And they are the ones who remember, not the kings, not the kings like Ahab and Manasseh, the wealthy or the wealthy landowners, they're all forgotten. Yet the prophets like Elijah and Isaiah are remembered and are honoured here upon earth by God's people and in heaven to this day. And they are an example to us of patiently enduring in times of trial. When everybody rejects you, when everybody rejects the message, Jesus affirms this, chapter 5, Matthew 5, 11, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you. I don't hear that. I don't hear that in the church. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you. I go to all kinds of evil against you. And closely on my account, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus wants us to be encouraged by their example. He wants us not to be cast down. He wants us to patiently endure. Or the apostle himself, who affirms the same truth in Hebrews 11. It's quite a long verse, I'll have to read it though. And what more shall I say from the from time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Japheth, David, Samuel, the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms and forced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, came mighty in war. Put foreign armies to flight. Women received back the dead by the resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with a sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats and destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy. Wandering about in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. What an example. Truly could have come in 2021, really. Worse afflictions and trials, it could get far worse. But you need to follow the example of these prophets and these saints of old. You think about through church history in the centuries, and even in this nation, Christians burnt at the stake. Ostracized. The example, and then the example of Job. For her, you know, we must have the patience of Job. Uh, although not a prophet, he was a man who, who lived, who loved God. He was recognized as a righteous man who suffered much. And yet, despite that suffering, Yes, he complained. But despite that suffering, he remained faithful to God. He endured. And this would have been identified at this time. The writing, there was a, the Testament of Job was a writing which was written in the first, uh, first century BC or first century AD. And that would have been uh, circulating about testament of Job's life, of how he endured patiently. And we know it's picked up from that theme at Christmas, that he was a man who could say, despite whatever happens, he knew that his Redeemer lived. That's what inspired him, that's what motivated, that's what he had, he had established his heart upon the Lord. And he serves as an example for us too. Just like the whole of the characters in the Bible of God's people, they serve as examples to us. No more is greater than seen in our Lord Jesus Christ, he said. Remind me to the Lord's head.
table today of what he endured and what he accomplished, how he was despised and rejected, how he suffered. 1 Peter 2.21 For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. Take up your cross and follow me. Things might not go as you planned in 2021, Reuben. They may not. But you must endure patiently. Whatever befalls us, he continued to entrust himself to the one who judges justly. And so should we. Finally, there be patient in the midst of suffering, be encouraged because the Lord is present. Verse 11, and you have seen the purposes of the Lord and how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. They have seen the Lord's purposes at work. They have seen and come to saving faith in the Lord themselves. They have been born again. This is their experience. They have seen the purpose of the Lord. How the Lord is compassionate and merciful to them. How he's saving the people. And through Christ they have become beneficiaries of that compassion and mercy. We echo those words. Despite all the various trials, despite all that happens, all that will happen in 2021, and we, He will not abandon us. In fact, He will come for us. He will never leave us, nor forsake us. God has not forgotten us. And yet it's quite easy, isn't it? When we suffer and things go pear shaped, when the ill health or tragedy strikes and financial hardships maybe become our lot. Whatever will take place, it's easy to the small person to feel forgotten, to be used and abused and left alone. The Lord is present. He's compassionate and he's merciful. And he's steadfast, shown his love towards us. This is what James is picking up on, Psalm 103 here, verse 8, that the Lord is merciful and gracious. This is part of his character. This who he is, he's slow to anger, he's bounding in steadfast love towards us. Like the weeping prophet Jeremiah who would say, I call this to mind and therefore I have hope. Because of the loving devotion of the Lord, we are not consumed. For his mercies never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Now on God's great love and mercy and compassion will be seen on that day, that glorious day of his appearing. But we shall be transformed and glorified and be like him. And we shall see him face to face. And we receive that blessed reward. And this is the truth. Verse 12. Commentators think, how does verse 12 fit in here? Well, we could see it as conclusion of, of this letter and he's certifying to the truth of, of this uh, letter but it also in context we can see that uh, rather than speaking evil against one another and when we grumble with one another that is something of speaking evil isn't it we should speak that which is good and true And so in 2021, let us establish our hearts. Be resolute as you wait for his appearing. Until then, be an example uh, to others. And look at the example of 
our Lord and the prophets and the patriarchs and all the saints of old who patiently endure. And remember, as you patiently endure all types of trials, it's not meaningless. It produces Christian maturity and holiness. It's bringing forth a harvest of righteousness and of peace. But that coming day of the Lord, all this that is taking place is in God's hand. It's good for us. God will bring us to Himself in due season. Amen. So we're going to sing a communion hymn now, and then just come around the table for a short.